time God will put you in place, people don't think you belong. And any time you're somewhere where people don't think you belong, you know what they say, Steve? Well, he don't deserve that. I'm like, bro, you got so much going on for you. You don't want me to have a little success? No. What? The reason I'm doing this show, dog, is because of how you are, the way you move, the what stuff I hear you say. I've never heard a dude talking out loud that sound just like me. D says she liked the interview. No, I okay. like the interview, how it went. Like, I like the whole chemistry between him and Shannon. I like Shannon's show. It's a good a show. I like uh, Shannon's show, too. I kept saying I like it was a good but interview. They was, he was caking for that nigga. Like, if I was on there and I had been married three times, the whole world would love to be like, motherfucker, you've been married three times. Great I don't never hear nobody say this about this man because they be caking for him. <laughs> he brought, and they cheated on his wife with a side bitch each time. <laughs> How is this motherfucker allowed to Man. give advice? Man. This is a goofy. Steve Harvey comes like he got the answers to shit. Homie, you marry a bitch bitches. that hustle money. Everybody know it. What the fuck? <laughs> Pick Steve Harvey as the representative for all things black. Steve Harvey, let's keep this shit funky. Steve Harvey's on his third marriage. Mm -hmm. His third wife was mistress to his second wife. <laughs> Yet, black people have anointed this motherfucker <laughs> the oracle when it comes to black dating. This nigga wrote a book on dating. <laughs> you want your third wife, homie? It, with all respect, why can't we pick a nigga <laughs> that know what he's talking about? Not B.L. Dooley. Married 25 years, same woman. Steve Harvey. Steve Harvey doesn't get any respect among the men. What man don't need a woman? What happened to men who were supposed to be responsible? Do you know that it's our job to take care of a woman and some children to have a family? That's our damn job. These, you all think I'm a sucker. I'm not being a sucker. I'm being noble. A man is supposed to take care of the, the, the widow woman and the orphans. You know that what Steve Harvey has chosen to do, he's trying to rewrite this into being something great. But you know it's not. Try to live your life without women. This ain't about la da da man. This is some bullshit without women. If it wasn't for women, what would you? Aristotle Nassus said it best. He said, if women did not exist, all the money in the world would have no meaning. You know it's not really advantageous. But Jason, how can you say that? I'll tell you why. Because there is one fundamental truth that you understand and you feel in your bones, in the pit of your soul, as a man. I'm talking to the men right now. We're going to come back to the women in a minute. But to the men listening. What's wrong with this is what all these other people have failed to teach you about. The banner on my page says that this is the definitive school of power dynamics. What you don't like about Steve Harvey's relationship with Marjorie is you can tell that she's the one in the position of power and he's serving her and just along for the ride. At no time is he exercising power whatsoever because if he were... He never would have married her in the first place. What is the benefit to him of marrying her? Steve, how have you been able to handle that? Because you know that people, there are a lot of people that smile and say things in your face, and you know they say things behind your back. Dog, how, how, how do you handle that? Good evening, America and the rest of the world. Xander J. Hobson here, stand-up comedian and entertainer, director and producer of boxing documentaries. Internet troll to those who need internet trolling. This is another episode of the Devil's Advocate brought to you by the Brilliant Artist Movement. Hey, folks, listen, I'm trying to grow the platform, so please subscribe, like this video, share it, and by all means, leave a comment in the comment section because I enjoy checking out the feedback from these videos that I make, as well as exchanging opinions and points of views with you all. Now, I cannot stress enough that I need you to hit the like and the share buttons because. My videos are not getting out there into the algorithm. I know for a fact that my notices do not go out to all my subscribers, and it's difficult for me to grow the channel as a result of that. So anyway, right? 
I've been missing an action for a spell because many of the trending topics were topics that I just could not see myself getting behind. I wasn't feeling them. However, recently, um, there's been a lot of talk about the Steve Harvey, Shannon Sharp interview. Um, most notably, my main man, Corey Holcomb, has some choice words to say about Steve Harvey. Owing to some bad experiences that he had along the comedy circuit with Steve. Another fella I just recently started following, a guy by the name of Jason Black. He had some issues with some of the things that Steve said. Jason Black just plain out felt as though Steve Harvey was giving young men bad information in regards to his relationship with Margie Harvey. Um, when I first started checking out the interviews, I was under the impression that the Shannon Sharp and Steve Harvey interview was largely about Steve's relationship with Margie. However, the relationship between, or the interview between Shannon Sharp and Steve Harvey was so much more than Steve's relationship with Margie. In fact, I don't even think the conversation about Marjorie Harvey was any longer than maybe like about 10 or 15 minutes. Of course, they talked about women, but for the most part, the conversation between Steve and Shannon was mostly about Steve's career as a stand-up comedian, his struggles as a young kid owing to his stuttering, and finally, his climb to star. Um, if you're one of these people that can enjoy a really good interview, a person telling you about how they reach or they achieve success, you'll like this interview between Steve and Shannon Sharp. When did you start writing jokes and started morphing and moving in that direction? Well, it was by accident, really, because a comedian named A.J. Jamal okay, was a friend of mine. And he worked at IBM. And I worked at General Electric. And he was doing comedy, but I didn't know what that was. And he would come to me and say, hey, man, I wrote this joke, what you think? Because he knew I was funny. Right. And so I would correct it. I would say, no, man, say this, this, and this. Right. And he would give me $10 every time I gave him a joke. So I would make an extra $40 a week. Right. You know, I'm going like, yeah, it's 1980, man. That's cool. I didn't, I didn't know what he was doing with, with, the, with the joke. Right. I'd never heard of a comedy club before. Right. I'd never heard of how I could be a professional comedian. And then one day I was over his house turning these jokes in, and this girl named Gladys Jacobs was there, and she said, you the dude that's writing these jokes for Jamal? And I went, yeah. She said, he the funniest, he the funniest comedian at the comedy club. I said, really? With your jokes? Yeah. I mean, he wrote his own, right. but I wrote some. You help. And I was going, what? What you talking about? She said, at the comedy club, he the funniest one. I said, what are you talking about comedy club? She said, you ain't never been to no comedy club. I said, no. She said, why are you writing them jokes for him? Why don't you do them yourself? So she said, I'm going to pick you up Tuesday night, and I'm going to take you to this place called Hilarity's Comedy Club, and I want you to see what they do. So I went down there, she picked me up, we rolled 40 minutes down to Hilarities. Is it in Cleveland? Where, where is this now? It's in Akron, Ohio. Akron, Ohio. Okay. Cuyahoga Falls, okay. Ohio. Okay. Right between Cleveland and Akron. Gotcha. Now, I'm best down there right by Kent State. Okay. Too. Yeah. I go in, and she say, sign up for next week. So I sign up. I don't even know what I'm doing. And I'm sitting down there, and I'm watching these comedians go up. Mm -hmm. And it's 10 of them. It's amateur night. Right. And I'm, I'm not laughing. She said, why are you not laughing? Because I'm rewriting all these jokes. Oh, okay. I'm just not, I'm sitting there going, man, he should have said this. He should have said that. And um, finally got to number 10, and they call this guy's name, and he ain't there. And they call his name again, and he ain't there. And they said, well, he's not here. We're going to go to next week's list. Give it up for Steve Harvey. Now, I'm <coughs> in a chair right here. And I hear her say, give it up to Steve Harvey. I turn to her and say, it's a dude in here got the same name I got. <laughs> she said, you a stupid son of a bitch. 
She was a hood chick. She yes. looked at me and said, you a stupid son of a bitch. She looked at me so disgusted. <laughs> you just a stupid son of a bitch. And I guess I was. She said, that's you. And they kept clapping. They said, where's Steve? And she said, here he is. Uh -oh. He said, Steve, come on up. I just ran up on stage, man. And, uh, and then I was lost, man. I didn't know what to do. Right. She said, tell him about when you were boxing. She just hollered out. So I was telling her on the way down right. about this dude named Bernard Taylor that I had fought at Golden Glove. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I imitated how he got in the ring because he was pigeon-toed. These white folks was dying laughing. So they got a laugh, and then I said, well, man, I got a laugh. Let me keep telling jokes. I walk on stage. They bring all 10 of us back up. They have a clap-off. I win the clap off. I win fifty dollars. You hooked. An agent came up to me and said, "Man, how long you been doing this? It's been a big business, just about three years, huh?" I said, "Yeah." President Nixon was said, "Defeat doesn't finish a man. Quitting does. A man isn't finished because he's defeated. A man is finished when he quits." Well. One of the most touching parts of the interviews that I seen with Steve was when Steve was talking about how the teacher was trying to discourage him from being on TV. Steve, not really knowing what he really wanted to do once he got on TV, had an overwhelming desire to be on TV. However, like many a black child back in those days, his teacher tried to discourage him from pursuing his dream. Um, I believe this was 1968. And at that time, blacks weren't in the type of prominent positions as you see today. Um, the irony behind this whole thing was in 1968, um, a teacher was trying to discourage Steve Harvey from being on TV. But here in 2023, a teacher will try to encourage a young child to be a member of the LGBTQ when a young child doesn't know any better. Here it is, Steve didn't know what exactly he wanted to do on TV. And now in 2023, a child really doesn't know what the whole sexual identity thing is. But in 2023, they're encouraging boys to be girls and girls to be boys but back in 1968 a teacher tried to discourage a young Steve Harvey from being on TV. It makes me think about that scene in Malcolm X when the teacher was trying to discourage young Malcolm X from being a lawyer. Now, the important thing is to be realistic. We all like you here, you know that. But you're a nigger. And a lawyer is no realistic goal for a nigger. But why don't you stop, Strowski? I get the best grades in class. I got voted class president. I want to be a lawyer. Now, I want you to think about something that you can be. You're good with your hands. Making things. People would give you work. I would myself. Why don't you become a carpenter? That's a good profession for a color. Wasn't your pa a carpenter? Jesus was a carpenter. But people like you as a person. You're doing real well. Remember what we said. Nothing succeeds like success. And you're here. Nothing succeeds like success. Right. As long as you're realistic. She, we had to write an assignment what you want to be when you grow up. Okay. First day of school. Right. Sixth grade. And I write I want to be on TV. She called everybody name, had them stand up. Then she made me come to the front. I go to the front, I think I'm finna get a gold star. I got the best answer in here. Right. Because I knew all my lines were better. Because Lonnie Cage had wrote on his paper, he won't be a doctor. His ass couldn't even read in the reading group. <laughs> so I don't know how Lonnie gonna be no damn doctor. This has got to be. So at least I wrote something that had a chance right. of happening. Lonnie ass got about a bigger chance of being a doctor as I got of walking my ass to the moon by Friday. <laughs> so, when she called me up there, man, and I, 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 she said, why did you write this on your paper? And I said, because that was our assignment for today. Right. And then I had a little stuttering problem, so I was stuttering a little bit. And she said, who do you know on TV in this neighborhood? 
And so I started, by the tone of her voice, I could tell that this wasn't going to where, this wasn't feel bold, gold star, baby. Yeah, yeah. This half of trying to break me right. in front of these kids. Right. And she was doing a damn good job. Right. Too. She was crushing it. Okay. Who in this neighborhood ever been on TV? Who in your family ever been on TV? Who in this school been on TV? And what make you think you can be on TV? And look at you standing there, you can't even talk. Mm. And you write something more reasonable on your paper. She crushed me, man. I said, damn, this is a teacher. Right. You know, this is in the 68, man. Right. I'm sitting there looking at this lady like, God, dog. But I just, I kept my paper and took it home. Right. And my mama said, your daddy going to beat you when you get home for being a smart ass. Because she had called home and said, your child is a smart ass. Right. So when my father came home, she said, Slick, this boy been a smart ass up at the school. And he said, well, what would you do? I said, I wrote on the paper I want to be on TV. My father said, well, what's wrong with that? And I saw a little glimmer of hope because right. I wasn't going to get this ass whooped and I thought I was going right. to get He said, well, your boy can be whatever he want to be. And, I, <laughs> and he said, "You don't worry about that. You keep that paper and you read your paper every morning, every right. night. And I did that. I kept that paper until I was about 27 years old. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're asking me, that was the most touching part of the whole interview. I found myself really, really pissed off after hearing that part of the interview because it made me think about how many young black kids had been discouraged by some white teacher. Um, thank God for Steve's father who believed in him. And sadly, I was really agitated at Steve's mom too because she sounded like one of these type of black women who just took what a white person said for gospel. But again, Steve's father was like, hey, no, we're not going to beat this boy down for that. Um, you keep that paper and you be the best you, you could be. If you want to be on TV, you keep working at that. So the interview had a lot of positive aspects of it. Now, again, most people who chopped the interview up and talked about the interview, they focused real heavy on the fact that Steve got into a relationship with Marjorie and you know the story on Marjorie is she was with one drug dealer hooked up with his cousin that whole hoopla uh, but again uh, they didn't address that in the interview and to be totally honest I really wasn't even interested in that part of Steve's life because as far as I'm concerned that's Steve's business I mean he knows the deal about Marjorie um, hey if that's what Steve wants. Hey, man, so be it. Now, again, when it comes back to Corey Holcomb, um, Corey Holcomb clearly has some issues with Steve owing to a bad experience. I heard too much fuck shit about Steve. <laughs> Steve a hater, though. He is not going to let you shine, though. He when I was a young comic, that nigga cut my time down to five minutes because I was too funny. What happened? He did JJ, man. What did he do to JJ? Uh, he, he damn near said, JJ damn said he liked blackballing him a little bit. Like he was telling motherfuckers not to fuck with him or some shit like that. I believe. I, I, I ain't never heard nothing good about no motherfucker Steve Harvey. Uh, Jason Black. I can see where Jason Black was coming from because I neither like Steve Harvey or dislike Steve Harvey, but it was something about Steve Harvey that rubbed me the wrong way. And Jason Black summed the whole thing up in a tangible manner that I could wrap my mind around. Steve Harvey doesn't get any respect among the men. These, you all think I'm a sucker. I'm not being a sucker. I'm being noble. You know that what Steve Harvey has chosen to do, he's trying to rewrite this into being something great. But you know it's not. You know it's not really advantageous. But Jason, how can you say that? I'll tell you why. Because there is one fundamental truth that you understand and you feel in your bones, in the pit of your soul, as a man, I'm talking to the men right now, we're going to come back to the women in a minute, but to the men listening, what's wrong with this is what all these other people have failed to teach you about. The banner on my page says that this is the definitive school of power dynamics. 
What you don't like about Steve Harvey's relationship with Marjorie is you can tell that she's the one in the position of power and he's serving her and just along for the ride. At no time is he exercising power whatsoever because if he were, he never would have married her in the first place. And that's perfectly all right. Is that's what he wants to do. But when he tries to wrap it up in a nice little package and sell it to other men, that's an issue. And I think that Jason Black is right in his analysis of this whole thing. But at the end of the day, I'm a live and let live type of guy. Uh, Steve Harvey's story was an inspirational one. And as an up-and-coming comedian at 55 years old, um, it was really motivational to hear about how Steve got from point A to point Z as a comedian and as a businessman. And at the end of the day, as I sum it up, you get a lot of people who say that Steve Harvey can't give out advice as a married man because he's been married several times. Well, I don't believe that. Um, you can get good advice from anyone. Even a bum can say to you, hey, listen, man, if you be lazy, if you don't work, if you drink, you'll end up a bum and you don't want to be like me. So with that said, folks, the Steve Harvey interview was a great interview. I'm going to put various links um, in the remarks section so you can check out everybody's opinion on this whole Steve Harvey and Marjorie Harvey thing. But at the end of the day, the interview between Shannon Sharp and Steve Harvey was a great one. And I really done, and I really enjoyed it. Hey, I'm done with it. Bam!